there are 125 megabytes of free memory on this iPod. At 8 bits for each byte, that's 1 billion bits ready to store new data. 1 billion. In 2012, just a few minutes of high-definition video would take care of that. But there was a time when capacities of just a few thousand bits were the best you could get. Mind you, this happened in the 50s, when computers were scarcer than hen's teeth, and this tune would have made it on top of the pops. Like a warehouse of raw materials and finished products, memory holds data ahead of processing and the results once the computing operation has ended. No memory, no computers. No computers, no modern world. This is a module of magnetic core memory. Each of its 1600 minute magnetic donuts can store one bit of digital data. A one or a zero. A yes or a no. Six decades ago, this was the pinnacle of computer engineering and what made possible other advances in computation, communication, and transportation. To store large amounts of data, you could of course use magnetic tape. But then getting to a particular bit of information would mean waiting for the tape to rewind, which could take seconds and even minutes. This was a random access memory, which meant that you could get to your data in a millionth of a second. This is exactly what the computers of the age needed. Earlier types of RAM were notoriously unreliable, which meant that the whole computing operation needed to be halted every couple of hours. And it's no use having a fast computer if it spends most of its time being serviced. Despite its apparent complexity, core memory was extremely reliable. So computing could go on for days and even months before a memory error showed up. Painstakingly woven by laboratory technicians, usually women with a steady hand and endless patience, these devices relied on the interplay between electricity and magnetism to store one bit of data in every magnetic donut known as a core. Random access is achieved by arranging the memory locations in a grid pattern. Each core has one horizontal and one vertical wire passing through it and it's uniquely identified by its row and column number. Now, Ampere's law states that passing a current through a conductor generates a magnetic field around it. So if we send a current through one of our wires, it will create a magnetic field which will be felt by all the cores strung on that wire. Now, this field is not strong enough to permanently magnetize the cores, but if we do the same to one of the horizontal wires as well, then the core at the crossing point will feel the combined magnetic field from the two wires. And this field is intense enough to permanently align the magnetic regions of the core to point in the same direction. We have just programmed one memory location. To program the bit to the other value, we simply reverse the current through our wires so that the resulting magnetic field points the other way. A third, or sense wire, is threaded through all the cores and serves for reading data from memory. First, the memory location is selected by passing a current through its row and column wires. A brief electrical pulse is recorded in the sense wire if the bit was yes, but if the bit was no, the sense wire stays silent. Core memory has no moving parts, and if stored in a special rack, it's robust and reliable. When we turn the power off, it remembers its data. We say it's a non-volatile random access memory, and in that sense, it's the precursor of both the working memory and the long-term flash memory in today's devices. But its shortcomings became apparent when larger size arrays were attempted. There was a limit to how small the components could get before the technicians would simply fail to manipulate them. So even by using the thinnest threads and the tiniest cores, high capacity modules would be impractically large and exceedingly expensive. The technology's final demise came in the 1970s with the development 
of one of humanity's most remarkable inventions, the integrated circuit. Electronic memories made inside a single piece of silicon were eventually miniaturized thousands of times to the astounding capacities and affordability we know today. In its time, core memory was not only the best way of storing data for quick retrieval, but the technology which helped computing through its difficult yet incredibly constructive teenage years.